These podcasts are being released in conjunction with the 5th National Climate Assessment. They feature conversations among NCA authors and staff about the report, the science behind the report, and the participants' experiences and perspectives. They do not represent official positions of the United States government. Enjoy! Startlement. It is a forgotten pleasure. The pleasure of the unexpected blue-bellied lizard skittering off his sunspot rock, the flicker of an unknown bird by the bus stop. To think, perhaps, we are not distinguishable, and therefore no loneliness can exist here. Species to species in the same blue air, smoke, wing flutter buzzing, a car horn coming so many unknown languages. To think we have only honored this strange human tongue. If you sit by the riverside, you see a culmination of all things upstream. We know now we were never at the circle center. Instead, all around us, something is living or trying to live. The world says, What we are becoming, we are becoming together. The world says, one type of dream has ended and another has just begun. The world says, once we were separate and now we must move in unison. Welcome to the companion podcast of the Fifth National Climate Assessment. In this special bonus episode, we're focusing on something new, the art of NCA5. The national climate assessments have always contained data visualization and graphical information related to the climate. In fact, we have an amazing graphics team and each assessment has been chock full of really beautiful and instructive figures. For the first time ever though, NCA5 took visual communication in a slightly new direction by also incorporating climate-related art and poetry. In a first-of-its-kind collaboration, the U.S. Global Change Research Program partnered with the 24th U.S. Poet Laureate Ada Lamone to develop an original poem for the 5th National Climate Assessment. You just heard Ada read her poem, Startlement, and you can also read it on the NCA5 website where it was published for the first time. Ada joined our authors at an all-author meeting earlier this year and spoke with many of them to get inspiration for her poem. I really think Startlement captures the feelings of connection to the environment that many of us share and reveal a deep connection to the world we seek to live in and protect. Additionally, in this episode, we'll talk about a new initiative for NCA5, which was the Art by Climate Project. This effort invited visual artists to submit work focused on climate change around the themes of the 5th National Climate Assessment. So artwork that looked at the causes of climate change, the impacts, and the strength of our collective response. The call resulted in over 800 submissions from all across the nation, and our jury of experts at the Art and Science Interface ultimately selected nearly 100 works to be featured in the NCA. I can't wait to talk more about these amazing and innovative efforts that were a really important part of the 5th National Climate Assessment. So let's get started. Salvage. On the top of Mount Pisgah, on the western slope of the Mayakamas, there's a madrone tree that's half burned from the fires, half alive from nature's need to propagate. One side of her is black ash, and at her root is what looks like a cavity that was hollowed out by flame. On the other side, silvery green broad leaf shoots ascend toward the winter light, and her bark is a cross between a bay horse and a chestnut horse, red and velvety like the animal's neck she resembles. I have been staring at that tree For a long time now, I am reminded of the righteousness I had before the scorch of time. I miss who I was. I miss who we all were before we were this, half alive to the brightening sky, half dead already. 
I place my hand on the unscarred bark that is cool and unsullied, and because I cannot apologize to the tree, to my own self I say, I am sorry. I am sorry I have been so reckless with your life. Coming up. When you are looking and you are paying attention in those ways, you also see how things are shifting. What could be more worthy of our attention than the planet that gives us life? Ada Lamon, the 24th U.S. Poet Laureate, joins us to talk about the poems she wrote for NCA5 and just how connected art and science can be. Thank you so much for joining us, Ada, and thank you for reading your poems for us. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. We were really lucky to have you join all of our authors at one of our working meetings earlier this year. And I got to say, you you won them over right away by calling them the noticers. Yeah, I was thinking about some of the similarities between poets and those environmental scientists and scientists that are interested in deeply looking at the world. And I kept thinking, oh, we are noticers. We have been the noticers. We are the people that even as children stared at the creek too long, were the people that noticed how the ants moved and noticed how a tree was doing all of these things. And I kept thinking, oh, this is a similarity is that that deep looking at the world is yes, an artistic endeavor, but also often a scientific endeavor. And so I think that for me, being appreciative of the noticers and the work that the noticers do felt, you know, at my core, a way of celebrating both the artists and the scientists. Yeah. You could see people just sit up and feel seen by your words. And we had authors coming up to us afterwards, you know, telling us how much that meant to them for the noticers to be noticed. So thank you for that. Oh, that means a lot to me. You know, I think for me, I didn't necessarily get in trouble as a kid, but I definitely was the kid that stared out the window too long, that would sort of get lost in in the grasses and the, the oak trees and have to be pulled back to class. And I feel like that is so much a part of who I am as an artist. And even when I met all of the incredible authors that were working on this assessment, you could feel that in the room, that these were all people that wanted to deeply look at the world. And, you know, that deep looking is also a way of of loving. So it's not just noticing, it's a way of appreciating. And I think that's something to be recognized too. That is how I got into science as well, running through fields and stomping through ponds and climbing trees. And, you know, growing up, I'm from the Midwest and I had never seen the ocean. So I also thought, oh, if I study the ocean, I'll get to see it one day. And it worked. (laughs) That desire to see the world and, and appreciate it is what led me to climate science as well. Yeah. Yeah. That makes total sense to me because I feel like When you are looking and you are paying attention in those ways, you also see how things shift are shifting. What could be more worthy of our attention than the planet that gives us life that we live on? We're so lucky to have you read your poems for us, not just because you're an amazing poet or the 24th Poet Laureate of the United States, but also because so much of your work is related to the topics we talk about in the Fifth National Climate Assessment. You know, we are looking at physical changes in our climates. We're looking at how our forests and our coastlines are changing and also what that means to people and how people are responding, how people are feeling about it, their health, their well-being, how it affects our social systems and our economies. So there's just so many different pieces that I think connect to the way you describe nature in so many of your poems. Yeah, thank you so much. I feel like there's a lot of ways in which we have been talking. When you and I first met and had our one of our first conversations, we used the word adaptation. It's something to think about when I think for so long we've talked about the climate as something that's coming, not something that is happening now. 
And I think that that is an important distinction as we move forward. And the work you've done with the report will show us that and has shown us that. And I feel like as an artist, there is a way in which it's very easy as, you know, a lot of poets, we like to delve into the depth of despair. (laughs) You know, if you ask any 16 year old to write a poem, they'll think, okay, what's the worst thing that ever happened to me? And that's where they will start their poem, you know? And so I think that in my work in particular, I'm always interested in trying to find sort of the seam of light that's coming through, you know, like the plants leaning towards the light in my office, all of those things. And I feel like, especially when we talk about something huge and I think terrifying to a lot of people, the idea of the climate crisis, the idea of what's happening to our planet it's very easy to enter that depth of despair. But I think that you have to be very careful about what turns into awareness and what turns into doomism. And so I think that in my work, I'm always wanting to focus on bewilderment, on wonder, on beauty. And I think even when I sometimes feel uh, a, a little hardened towards hope or not wanting to be naive about what we face, I still can find so much wonder and awe in the natural world. And it's been a refuge for me as an artist and really as a human being. I think if I'm honest, even before we sat down to speak today, I have a huge silver maple in front of my window. And I got on the call a little early and waited and I was just taking some deep breaths and I meditate every day and I had just done a meditation. And then I just stared at trees, you know, and stared at the leaves. And I thought the best meditation for me has always just been staring at trees. And, um, and that's still where my poems come from. We did an art project for the first time for the national climate assessment and, and put out a call for visual art And it was really interesting in reviewing all of those amazing submissions. We received over 800 works from around the country, but you could really feel from those pieces of art, how people are experiencing climate change right now and how they're feeling about climate change. There was a lot of art that was showcasing the environments that people love but also the grief over losing some of those beautiful places. And then there were pieces that were really hopeful and had a lot of agency and courage in them. So it was was this beautiful look into how people are thinking about climate change in, in their own lives. I'm wondering if you can give us your opinion or speak a little bit about why it's so important to include things like art and poetry in the climate conversation. First of all, I love that you had a call for artist response. I just think that's so beautiful and necessary right now. And I think even what I'm hearing in terms of what you received, and I can't wait to spend some time with them, I feel like one of the biggest things that art and artistic expression can offer us is a sense of community. It works against isolation. And I think that when we get overwhelmed or full of grief, we can sometimes just stop there. It feels like that's all we can do is to hold that overwhelm, right? The container can only hold so much. And so we sit with grief. That's necessary. That's important. But we also have to see the other parts, the courage, the agency, the action, what art does is allow us to see all of those different perspectives. And we need that sense of community because I think when things go awry (laughs) is when we feel totally isolated and totally alone with those feelings. And so to witness others going through the full spectrum of emotions when it comes to the climate crisis, I think is really important. And it might give us ways to move forward And it might give us ways to grieve because I think grief is equally as important. And so I think for me, adding that artistic expression is really a way of coming to the issues holistically and with intention. So in some ways we can feel like we're taking a deep breath together 
before we move forward and as we move forward. We talk about adaptation as being prepared for or responding to these impacts. And we had a conversation with an author named Alyssa Quinton from Alaska, where she was talking about how critical it was to just know your neighbors and to have those social connections in your community as being such an important adaptation measure. And so I, I love what you had to say there about the role of community as a climate response, as an action towards climate mitigation and adaptation. Yeah, because I think it's so important that sometimes our brains sort of naturally create these hierarchical categories of things. And so if we caretake, think, oh, I must caretake this thing. I must caretake my child, my family. And then how do we become stewards of the earth as well? And if we think about caretaking in a holistic manner, it means ourselves, our neighbors, our plants and trees and animals. It's a whole way of allowing that interconnectedness to inform us as opposed to feeling sort of overwhelmed by, oh, look at all the things I have to think about. Instead, you know, if we can reframe that as thinking, look at all the things and all the ways that I get to love. That's amazing. We're actually speaking on a really big day for you, Ada. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you are bringing poetry and people's environments and nature together in the project that you launched just this morning. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for mentioning it. Yes, today is the launch of my National Poetry Project, which is called You Are Here, and it focuses on poetry in the natural world. And there are two significant elements to it. One is that we're partnering with the National Park Service and bringing poetry installations to seven different national parks around the United States. And people can go and sit and be with a poem in a beautiful area, and then also maybe be inspired to write something of their own. And then the second element is that there's an anthology of nature poems, new, brand new nature poems that is coming out from Milkweed Editions in partnership with the Library of Congress called You Are Here, Poetry in the Natural World. And that celebrates 50 contemporary poets that are writing really extraordinary responses to our planet and this crucial moment. So um, I'm very excited about the project. And to me, it speaks to how both poetry and nature give us a chance to breathe and give us a way of deeply looking and loving the world. I'm very excited to see the anthology and to see the poems from the national parks. It sounds fabulous. I want to leave by asking you a little bit about the future and maybe some advice you have for students and young people. I participated in this really cool event at the Smithsonian a few years back called Earth Optimism that connected scientists with high school students. And it was kind of a career thing, but also just sort of free space to ask questions. And I I talked to several students who, you know, when you're in high school, you don't necessarily know what you want to be when you grow up yet. And they were like, well, I either want to be a scientist or an artist. And I was like, you can do both. Please do both. We need both of those things. You don't have to choose. And I truly believe that we need art to solve the climate crisis. We, We need both the science and the art. Do you have any advice to students or young people who are thinking about these sorts of questions and and what to do next in their careers. Yeah, I love that. And your answer about doing both is so beautiful because you can do both. And in fact, they inform each other so naturally. Poetry, the arts, visual arts react to our environment. Uh, They respond to our environment. So they're perfect ways to sort of make your life flourish. I think that so many students that I meet are torn because they think they have to make a decision about who they are. And the best advice anyone ever gave to me is like, you are who you are. What you do isn't who you are. So you can do a million different things. So I think my advice, especially when it comes to students who feel like they have a proclivity for both arts and science, would be really to to make sure that you're making room for both things. Because I think one 
when you're talking about the scientific world and you're working in those classes, which we know contain a lot of vigor and can be overwhelming at times, I think you might need a poetry class or two to remember who you are a little bit as you get lost in the larger world of you know, what you're discovering in your science classes. So for me, I think I would offer one word, which would be balance, to try to find the balance. What are the things that excite you, but what are the things that caretake you too? And um, I think you can do both. Dead stars. Out here, there's a bowing even the trees are doing. Winter's icy hand at the back of all of us, black bark, slick yellow leaves, a kind of stillness that feels so mute it's almost in another year. I am a hearth of spiders these days, a nest of trying. We point out the stars that make Orion as we take out the trash, the rolling containers, a song of suburban thunder. It's almost romantic as we adjust the waxy blue recycling bin until you say, man, we should really learn some new constellations. And it's true. We keep forgetting about Antlia, Centaurus, Draco, Lacerta, Hydra, Lyra, Lynx. But mostly, we're forgetting we're dead stars, too. My mouth is full of dust, and I wish to reclaim the rising, to lean in the spotlight of streetlight with you toward what's larger within us, toward how we were born. Look, we are not unspectacular things. We've come this far, survived this much. What would happen if we decided to survive more, to love harder? What if we stood up with our synapses and flesh and said no? No to the rising tides, stood for the many mute mouths of the sea, of the land. What would happen if we used our bodies to bargain for the safety of others, for earth? If we declared a clean night, if we stopped being terrified, if we launched our demands into the sky, made ourselves so big people could point to us with the arrows they make in their minds, rolling their trash bins out. After all of this is over. Coming up. Have you been surprised by the reaction to art by climate? Yes and no. On the one hand, yes, because this was an out of the box thing to do. On the other hand, I'm not surprised because I just know that art engages people emotionally and scientists are people. The Art by Climate Initiative was a first of its kind effort to bring together artists and scientists in the National Climate Assessment. NCA Senior Staff Manager Elisa Lustig, who oversaw the project, joins us after the break. I'm very pleased to be joined by Aliza Lustig, who's a senior manager on the National Climate Assessment and the champion of our Art by Climate project. Welcome, Aliza. Thanks, Allison. It is great to be here. Can you tell us first, what is Art by Climate? So Art by Climate is the first ever call for art to be featured in the National Climate Assessment. It came about actually early on in your tenure as the director when you had the idea to better integrate art into the assessment. And it has evolved over the last year and a half to be a collaboration between agencies and between the arts and science community, bringing visual art into the report. Actually, Allison, I've always wondered, why did you want to do that? Yeah, it's a good question, because I, I wouldn't necessarily consider myself an artist. I'm just someone who appreciates art, and I think also appreciates the power of art. And I think we've had five national climate assessments now that have been chock full of really great science. So I, I guess I just wanted to expand it a little bit more and bring some of the topics in the assessment out in ways that we haven't done or to audiences that we haven't reached before. From a real 
I don't know, more technical perspective. I've noticed over the years that it's the figures from the assessments that end up getting used. You know, years and years later, I'll see a figure, you know, on a slide or in a presentation or in a news article or something. And and so it's always made me think about how the art and the figures in the assessments have much more stickiness to them sometimes than even the words do. Although, of course, the words are important too. So I proposed this early on just in the hopes that others would think it was a good idea. And so I was really pleased when you did. And I know you're an artist yourself. I think it lent to this project that you could bring that part of yourself to your job and make this so successful. Yeah. Bringing art and science together is something I never thought I would get to do for work, but it has been very rewarding. Back to the idea of visuals impacting people and sticking. I will be interested to see how the art does that as well, because, and maybe less so for scientific figures, but definitely with art, you know, it strikes people in a different way that allows them to internalize the science that they're seeing and have it stick. I think a lot of the art that we received will do that. It has done that for me. When I've seen the work, it's striking and you feel like the power of it from looking at it. You just like have this moment where you're like, yes, this is it. This is what we're talking about when we talk about sea level rise or hurricanes. Like this is it because it's a human issue and it comes out, the emotions of it come through in the art. So yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see how that does stick with people. Can you share a little bit more about the process that we went through and how we collected the art and selected from those 800 pieces, the artworks that appear in the assessment? The first thing we did was realize what we knew and what we didn't know. And that prompted us to convene a group of federal folks across the agencies with expertise at the art science interface. We had folks from NOAA and Smithsonian and FEMA and NSF, and we all got together to talk about, you know, what this could be. That was a really informative group of people who helped us shape a call for visual art that went out to both youth and adults across the country. We did our best to reach a very new group of people. The arts community is not one we typically engage with, but we ended up getting 800 submissions, which was fantastic. We then had to sort through 800 pieces because we could not include 800 pieces in the NCA. And we down-selected. We got from 800 pieces to 92 pieces. And it was both very difficult, but also fascinating. I don't know, Allison, I'm curious to hear your take on what it was like to go through all of those works. I loved going through all 800 pieces. (laughs) It was definitely a fun part of my job. And I was just really struck by how diverse the artworks were coming from different parts around the country, of course, but then also the different mediums that people were using. So things like gouache and paint and lino cuts and textiles like quilts. People used a lot of found objects or charcoal from wildfires to develop their artworks. I was really struck by the creativity in the medium. What were some of your favorites? You know, one of my favorites was by Ian Van Collar, and it's the piece of art that shows the scientist Dr. Avila holding an ice core. And I really love that one because I used to be a paleoceanographer. And so the science in that one really speaks to my background. And I loved the way that the artist worked with the scientists to have the scientists inscribe a lot of notes onto the photograph itself on what we were seeing and what it meant. And it just reminded me of when I was back in grad school and I always kept notes in a composition notebook and it was always filled with like drawings and little side comments to myself or reminders to look something up. You know, the way the notes on that photograph were arranged and included little pieces of art itself there was just something nostalgic about that to me. And so I I really connected with that piece. How about you? I think one piece that really stands out to me as I was reviewing all the artworks was Laura Tanner's piece called Dish. It's ink and gouache. And kind of in the foreground, you see the rising sea, or I don't know if it's rising, but it is the sea. And then you just see this spread, this gorgeous spread of food, of produce, of fish, of meat, of grain. And it's arranged as it would be for a feast. That artwork 
reflects her research into the ways people eat and like the different culinary practices and social justice in the American South. And I think what really struck me about that is that much in the way that, you know, in the National Climate Assessment, we are striving to integrate disciplines, social science and physical science. Her work is kind of doing that same thing. She's grappling with migration and tradition and how people relate to the land. And then, you know, how all of that interacts with the changing climate. I know you can't limit yourself to just one favorite. Tell us about a few others that you love and why. Okay. One more that I really am excited about is one of our youth pieces by Maggie L. She's from Cleveland, Ohio, and she used acrylic paint and a print with gel pad. And she also actually has a triptych. And it is this sci-fi scene. It has Godzilla, there are aliens, there are flying cows, there's a cityscape. And the imagination of it really energizes me and it gives me hope. I think it's just because students and young people are really thinking about the world and interpreting their world in creative ways. And it's that kind of creativity that I feel like is going to drive us forward and I hope, you know, power our response to climate change. So I just absolutely loved the imagination behind her piece. I guess the last one I'd like to mention is by Tammy Phelps, and it is called Methane Blues. Tammy uses a combination of oil paint and cold wax. It is basically a landscape painting of the Alaskan permafrost and the tundra there. Her work is both stunning and still there's a sense of sadness. And I think her connection to the place really comes through to me just in how lovingly she treats it. Also, you know, the way she's layering her medium kind of mirrors the layers of the Arctic landscape in a way that I think is really beautiful. Have you been surprised by the reaction to art by climate? Yes and no. On the one hand, yes, because this was an out-of-the-box thing to do. On the other hand, I'm not surprised because I just know that art engages people emotionally and scientists are people. When you stop and think about it, there is a lot of sadness and grief, for example, that one grapples with when doing this work. And I think there's a certain kind of release that comes with interacting with the artwork. So I think it's actually quite good for the scientists as much as it will be for the people who ultimately receive this assessment, the American public. You're reminding me that I, you know, I started the very first podcast by talking about why there are three different reasons to have courage, to have climate courage. And I feel like you've just given us a fourth one. So thanks. Oh man. Yay. Before we go, can you tell people how the art is being used in the assessment? Yeah, I, I am excited that this artwork is going to show up across the assessment where possible, you know, we'll be using artworks as banners that precede the chapters. A subset of the pieces will also be embedded into the chapter narratives. And, you know, we're going to use specific design elements to help distinguish the art from the scientific graphics. And then we will also have, which I'm very excited about, an online gallery on the NCA5 website where you can go and see all of the works together. So we actually, and we haven't mentioned this yet, but we do have five award winners that the jury selected. So those folks, along with our top finalists, will be up at the top. And then you will see the full collection of 92 works just below. Overpass. The road wasn't as hazardous then. When I'd walk to the steel guardrail, lean my bendy girl body over and stare at the cold creek water. In a wet spring, the water'd run clear and high, minnows mouthing the sand and silt a crawdad shadowed by the shore's long reeds. I could stare for hours, something always new in each watery wedge, a bottle top, a man's black boot, a toad. Once a raccoon's carcass half under the overpass, half out, slowly decayed over months. i check on him each day, watching until the white bones of his hand were totally skinless and seemed to reach out toward the sun as it hit the water, showing all five of his sweet tensile fingers still clinging. I don't think I worshipped him, 
his deadness, but I liked the evidence of him, how it felt like a job to daily take note of his shifting into the sand. Coming up. I was thrilled because over the years I've used the National Climate Assessments as reference for my various degree programs. And it felt like a very full circle moment to be able to contribute a piece of my own growth and learning that was very grounded in the conceptual framework of a National Climate Assessment. Two of our selected artists joined the podcast to talk about their inspiration and motivation for joining the first NCA Art by Climate effort. I am thrilled to be talking to two of our artists who contributed to the Art by Climate project today. I'm joined by Tammy West, who is an artist based in Austin, Texas. Her work Keep It Together was selected as the top award-winning piece in the Art by Climate collection. Welcome, Tammy. Hello. And I'm also joined by Simona Klosnitzer. Simona is based in Port Townsend, Washington, and is a recent graduate of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And she contributed her work in the Eye of the Storm, which was selected as the second award-winning piece in the Art by Climate collection. Welcome, Simona. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for joining us. I'm thrilled to have you here. I've got to start by saying how grateful I am to you two for submitting your artwork to our first ever call for art for the National Climate Assessment. And we received more than 800 submissions from all around the country. So it's it's really a pleasure to get to speak with you today. Tammy, let me start with you. And maybe before we even get into the piece of art that you submitted for Art by Climate, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and the kind of art you create? Well, as you said, I live in Austin, Texas. Most of the time I create pieces that are land-based, which means the art exists outside. It's not usually seen on the wall unless a photograph of the final piece is printed, but it is direct connection to the natural world and the issues that it has. Simona, how about you? Tell us a little bit more about yourself and the kind of work you do. I'm an environmental educator and artist, and I work with students aboard a sailboat, and I take them out sailing for sometimes close to a month at a time and teach them about marine policy and marine science and also integrate my own arts curriculum. So I do that for the summer seasons, and then in the winters, I do a lot of mural work where I use muraling as a technique to engage youth about environmental justice themes. And sometimes I make my own work too, which is what I did here for the piece I submitted that was part of my graduate degree program at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Simona, why did you participate in the Art by Climate project? Well, I made my piece uh, before the Art by Climate project was actually announced. But then when it was announced, I was thrilled because over the years I've used the National Climate Assessments as reference for my various degree programs. And it felt like a very full circle moment to be able to contribute a piece of my own growth and learning that was very grounded in the conceptual framework of a national climate assessment. Felt really fulfilling and really exciting to me. And I am just so honored to have contributed to this project. Oh, thank you. That's beautiful that this is both a useful report to you and and now you are our contributor. How about you, Tammy? What what drove you to participate in Art by Climate? I have a whole series of work that's about climate change and my sadness about it. It's called Protecting the Sacred, which is our land and our planet, <laughs> everything that we know of. So it's been a really personal journey in explaining my heart and where my heart is, which is sadness about climate change. So it was a perfect connection. The thought of submitting my piece and possibly having it accepted into the National Climate Assessment, I couldn't imagine a better place to show my art. To have the data next to something that connects your emotions just seems perfect. 
Thank you for your contribution. And thank you for sharing your art with all of the readers of the National Climate Assessment. You know, I'm, I'm recognizing we're on a podcast, but we're talking about visual art in some ways here. If you can describe for us first what your piece looks like, but then also tell us a little bit more about how you created it and, and what your process was for that, Simona. My piece is a overlay of multiple lino cuts that I made. Essentially what a lino cut is, is I carve into a piece of linoleum and take away material and then roll ink onto it and press it onto paper to create a print. And for Art by Climate, I created a series of three different prints representing different components of hurricanes. So the first piece was about our human perceptions to hurricanes and our lived experience of that. The second piece was about the infrastructural and physical components of hurricanes. And the third piece was about loss and grief and the silence after that storm. And then I cut them all up and overlaid them on top of each other to create one piece that was cohesive and accumulative of all of those different components to represent that reality of a storm. I loved hearing you describe those three different layers. That brings a lot of new meaning to the piece for me. Thank you. Tammy, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your process and what your piece looks like, but also getting a really place-based art sort of theme from this conversation. If you can tell us more about where your piece took place. So I live in Austin and right now, as we speak, we're in an exceptional drought, the highest category of drought that there is. So our earth is cracking, literally, and it affected my heart, seeing everything brown and dying and sad. And through my art, I wanted to put it back together and pull the cracks back together. So I found a place with really beautiful cracks <laughs> artistically. And I took red yarn and nails and a hammer and I went out into the land and I sewed one really long crack back together, going back and forth with the nails and going back and forth with the string. So it looks like sutures or like I'm sewing it with my hands as you would in a fabric. Then it was printed and that's what you see for the National Climate Assessment. Can people go out and see that piece in real life or was it sort of a one-time installation? I was up for a little bit. I chose a place that uh, not many people would go on purpose because I didn't want anybody to mess with it until I was ready to photograph it. So I invited people and it was up for probably about a month and then I took it down. So I took photographs on the more recent end of that. So it was up for about a month. One of the things that I know that we really loved about your piece was that there was a sense of action there and a sense of response to the impacts we're seeing, but also almost a sense of futility of trying to stitch the earth back together with red string. I'm curious how people reacted to your art when they saw it in real life. Did it bring them a sense of agency or hope or, or grief? What sort of reactions did people have? From what I could tell, they first were sad about what's happening. I think that everybody is sad about it in their heart anyway. And this art just brings out the sadness about it. But several people talked to me about how it affected their emotions. They were telling me, oh, I want to plant more trees or I want to get solar panels or things like that. So it actually did through grief and through sadness about what's happening. It promoted action in their life, which that's is great. That's why I do art. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Simona, does that resonate with you? Did you have similar reactions to your piece? Yeah, I think my piece also deals similarly with that layer of grief as well. And I really love how Tammy Years is so elegant. There's so much depth, but it is very simple and very clear to see. And I love that. And I think my piece takes a different route where there's a lot happening and it takes a moment to like center yourself on on all these different components. And so I think a way that people have been engaging with mine is a little bit more slowly and taking in different components and pieces of that all throughout time. I hope that my piece inspires a bit of agency as well and 
that it sparks conversation and at least can be a modality for processing any kind of grief that comes along with loss um, and in, in storms. So Mona, we were, you know, when we were looking at your piece on the jury, we talked about how there were so many elements in there that you think are stable, cars and telephone poles and, and homes. And then in your piece, there's a, a real sense of motion of those things as they're getting swept up into the storm. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the history or your family history that informed this piece. Yeah, my family history really did inspire this piece. My grandma moved to New York City after a hurricane swept through Puerto Rico back when she was two. And growing up, I always knew this history, but it wasn't really until I began working on this piece of art that I interpreted it as being related to climate. And now I think of that story as really being like a living history of climate impacts on my own cultural heritage and my own identity. Because I, I grew up with pieces of Puerto Rican heritage that were passed down to me, like my name, for instance, Simona Mercedes, was named after two of my Puerto Rican ancestors. And I have handwritten family recipes and grew up with a lot of these components, but also a lot of those components were lost in that process of emigration. It's been my own journey of making this piece of art and also trying to reconnect with that and understand how climate impacts trickle down through generations and how as storms continue to worsen in that region because of climate change, how cultural heritage and our own identities will shift or hopefully we'll be able to hold on to it really strongly through any kinds of transitions like that. Simone, I love that about your piece that it's really rich and shows so much going on with emotion and also the how it connects to your, your own heritage. Tammy, I'm going to turn back to you. And you talked a little bit about how people seeing your art empowered them to think more about climate change or maybe even take action on climate change. From your perspective, what is the role of art in our nation's climate change conversation? I think everybody gets that climate change is happening, but I don't think in some people's hearts that it really has touched them yet. And I think that the role of art in this case is to touch people's hearts so that they really understand it. Instructions on not giving up. More than the fuchsia funnels breaking out of the crab apple tree. More than the neighbor's almost obscene display of cherry limbs shoving their cotton candy colored blossoms to the slate sky of spring rains. It's the greening of the trees that really gets to me. When all the shock of white and taffy, the world's baubles and trinkets, leave the pavement strewn with the confetti of aftermath, the leaves come. Patient, plodding, a green skin growing over whatever winter did to us, a return to the strange idea of continuous living, despite the mess of us, the hurt, the empty. Fine, then. I'll take it. The tree seems to say, a new slick leaf unfurling like a fist to an open palm. I'll take it all. I want to end this bonus podcast episode with something of a plea to all the artists out there, and not just the poets and the visual artists that we talked to today, but the dancers and the musicians and the playwrights and the other creators out there. I'll mention this in my conversation with Ada, but I really want to emphasize it again here. I truly believe that it will be the artists who will save the world. That might sound odd coming from a climate scientist, from someone like me who has devoted their entire career towards quote unquote saving the world. But artists, you have such an important task ahead of you. You have the power to spark curiosity and to invoke empathy. 
You have the power to show us how climate change is threatening the people and places we love, our livelihoods and pastimes, and how we think of home and community. You have the power to express our collective grief and our collective hope and courage. And importantly, you have the power to motivate action, to spur creative responses to new and growing risks. What I'm trying to say, artists, is that you belong in the climate conversation. You have a critical role in how the country and the world faces climate change. We need you. Thank you for listening. And whatever your medium happens to be, please keep creating and keep being a part of the climate solution. The NCA5 Companion Podcast was produced by the U.S. Global Change Research Program. These podcasts are intended to provide context and perspectives from the authors and participants of NCA5. They do not represent official positions of the United States government. Production by Chris Avery and Allison Crimmins, who also served as host. Editing, mixing, and scoring by Mallory Hinks. Thank you to Elisa Lustig, Aaron Grade, Lori Howell, and Mike Cooperberg for their support in developing this series. Thank you also to Ada Lamone, the 24th Poet Laureate of the United States, for providing her poetry to the project. The NCA is the U.S. government's premier report on climate change impacts, risks, and adaptation across the nation. It is a congressionally mandated interagency effort that brings together hundreds of experts from federal, state, and local governments, as well as the academic, nonprofit, and private sectors. Information about the NCA 5, including the process used to create the assessment, can be found on the NCA5 website at nca2023.globalchange.gov.